All right, well, I, I don't know if I need to introduce Brenda King, right, because you all know her, but we are honored to have Brenda here at the Kuhn Museum. It's really a special treat um, yeah, as a, an artist, an art historian, and a teacher, and we're thrilled to hear more about uh, Brenda's new body of work. And does it have a title of the series, or? Tupelo. Tupelo. And how many, how many uh, pieces in this series have? Well, so far, um, there are nine. There will be more, but these are all paintings done during pandemic. Right. Well, maybe, maybe I'll turn it over to you, and you can introduce um, this particular painting and sure. share with us the rest of the series. Well, I think I was telling you this afternoon that uh, the last painting I have done is this piece, and it's called Copper Treasures. And copper refers to the Chickasaw Nation, which I am a member of. And uh, early on in the 1700s, they collected copper as adornments. And so copper, the word copper is in a lot of my paintings. So historically, that's that's an image that I think of. Treasures is another part that we talk about. When uh, we go back to Mississippi and the early other uh, forest area for Chickasaws, treasures mean mounds. There were burial treasures or burial mounds, and then there were mounds where there were things that were, I guess you would say trash or old broken pots or different things that were under the ground, and they were mounds as well, and I call them treasure mounds. And so this one refers to that, but as I got into it and was painting it, I was reading a book on, um, actually Okinawa, and in our family history, we spent almost seven years in Okinawa. And so we stayed uh, in Kakazu, Kakazu, is the main line of Shuri defense for the World War II. And there, uh, at that time in the 60s, no one was allowed up there, especially. Uh, so what we did is we bought a house up there and lived with Okinawan villagers. And so as I did that, I began to learn the history of Okinawans and what they had been through. And I learned about the different times that the island was occupied by different countries. And that may not sound interesting, except that it is so pertinent to what's happening today. And so the more I read about the book, and I had written my master's thesis on this subject as well. So this has been going on for many, many years for me. <clears throat> I'm interested in not what the wars do, but what the people do under the sky and so that was part of my story. And I thought this might be an autobiography visually done. And that's what this piece is. And as I began to paint, I began to write things back that I remembered. And in Okinawa in the 1300s, China was the first big country that recognized that Okinawa was a wonderful strategic place in Southeast Asia. It was a good stopping off place. And so they invited the king of Okinawa to come and stay for a length of time and learn to be a tribute state to China. So they went to China, a little ship, and the story of that's on the painting back behind there. And that's another whole story. But it, the story is about the travel that the Okinawans made for two years to China. That would be in 13, I think, 47. And then what happened after that, the Japanese figured out that Okinawa was also a valuable place. And so they came in and told King Sato, they said, we want you to be a tribute state. And they said, well, we're already a tribute state of China. And they said, well, just keep that a secret. You really belong to us. And this King Sato said, I'd like to stay as my own. And they said, no, you can't. We'll just cut off your head. So he then was a tribute to Japan. And then along came an occupying country of, of the World War II. And what happened there is we had Americans that were occupying. OK, as an artist, why am I interested in all of this? Because it's a matter of 
being an occupied country, being taken over by another language and everything, how do you keep your culture? How do you keep your identity? How do you keep who you really are and who your people are? And so that became the thesis for me, was how we keep ourselves in chaos. And so what happened in Okinawan Asian countries during wartime, they buried their treasures. And the treasures for Okinawans were their textiles. And each little tiny village, each had a different kind of textile, a different design. So you knew where they were from by that textile. So when the women found out that there was war, the Japanese warned them that the Americans were going to annihilate them, which actually was unfair because the Japanese were the ones that actually were the worst on the Okinawans. And 62,000 died of that cause. And so the women, though, buried their treasures. So they buried their textiles. And usually before you could come back and dig them up, but this time because of the bombs, the treasures were in pieces. And so a lot of my paintings have little bits and pieces because of that theory. And that's also a different way of describing chaos within a culture. <clears throat> so I have on the other side, I took, I taught for University of Maryland, Okinawan culture. And I would take people into the city of Naha, to the museum there, and I would show them stacks and stacks of textiles. And in that, they would be in small pieces. So that's part of what I'm telling you in this story. And as I got to thinking about it, I thought it's interesting that there are more than just the Okinawans that have been occupied. There are more than just the Okinawans. And when I went back home, my mother said, it's time for you to go to a powwow. You need to come back home to Oklahoma. You need to see the Indians again because I am Chickasaw, come back to home. And I did, and I went to a powwow, and the first thing I saw were all the dances. And it was amazing to see all of these pieces and patterns all moving at the same time and all different. It wasn't one regalia, it wasn't one nation. It was 656, or don't quote me, six something in that term of tribal affiliations. And so you cannot paint just one. And if everybody's dancing, all of these people are coming together. All these traditions are mixing and changing. And so I began to paint abstractly the visions I was seeing in dance. And that represented to me something very interesting. I had a good time with it. And I had a show in Mississippi at a museum there. And uh, as Chickasaws, I think seven or eight of us decided to get in a car and go to Tupelo. Tupelo, Mississippi is the homelands where the mounds that I described to you in the very beginning started. So we went to visit the mounds. And that was a religious experience for us because we were going back to see where our great, great, personally, my great, 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 great grandfather lived. And I found that place. I found the monument, even, to him. And so it was a very important time for us. <clears throat> and we were looking at our past. And as we stood there, we toured the area. And there were swamp areas. And we began to realize this is another people who were removed from their homeland. They were taken from uh, plantations and homes uh, my grandfather was negotiating with presidents at that time. My grandfather, original, even earlier grandfather, worked with George Washington as a general. So these were Americans. They were Native Americans. They were the first people. And yet they were being removed from their homes. Try to think about that. If you had to pick up and pick up your treasures and move immediately, some of them were moved out within days of their homeland and said, you can leave and take what you can carry. And so they were removed from their language, their culture, and everything about them. And so it dawned on me that this is perpetual, that refugees are, they're always here with us. And how do we incorporate people who are in chaos? And so some of the paintings that I've done, 
the one back there also describes the chaos of being removed or changed from your culture. Happily for the Chickasaw Nation, we now have a program for, for languages, and so the children are relearning the languages. We only had 60 native speakers when we started this project several years ago. So in this painting, now get back to the painting, on the left-hand side, it's the story I began to tell you in the first place. It's Okinawa, and there's pieces of textiles. They're indigo, dark indigo dyes, which also ha had to do with oceans, and then the color indigo, which is Asian as well. And then I realized that there's oceans in the top there, and across the middle there are typhoons. And in Okinawa, that's usual. Every year we have typhoons. So I have the typhoons in the weather, and Karen, sitting here, my daughter, remembers the times when the pilots all left the island to save the planes and left the women and children in the houses to stay for the typhoon. And we saw some 180-mile winds, didn't we? We stayed for a week at a time, closed up in a house. And uh, so we have fond memories and kind of unusual ones as well growing up. On the bottom half of the painting, as I was playing, and a lot of this, I don't think you can see in this quite well, but there's a lot of green. And that was because of Tupelo, and I kept seeing those swamps and thinking, how did these refugees get through this? How did they manage this trek that they went through? And I thought, how do you carry a child? How would I have carried my daughter or my son through a swamp? What would I have chosen to take with me? Or what would I be allowed to? And you can watch on the news two or three weeks ago, and you can see people, refugees, with nothing. And so <clears throat> I was doing the end of this painting, and a friend of mine called from Oklahoma. She's on a television channel there, and we're friends, and her name is Quintron. She said, Brenda, I'm a, refuge, a refugee. My mother and I came from Vietnam. And I said, Quinn? I was in Okinawa and met flights of refugees in the 60s. I met those flights because the Japanese wouldn't let them off the plane. There were some diseases coming from the plane. It was really fascinating. So I said, it'd be funny if I met you. And she began to tell me the story of how her trek went. They came with nothing. And how did they survive this? And what did they come to be? And she told me the hardest part was she never did assimilate completely, and cultures have a really hard time becoming a part of another culture. You may think you are. I thought I was Okinawan, but actually everyone could look at me and say she's not Okinawan. But you can live a long time in a culture and become so enmeshed in it that you are at least a, a kissing cousin. And so my whole purpose was to say we need to recognize this and recognize people who are coming with nothing and what they have to offer. And her daughter just started university this year. She was at the top of the SAT scores, of course. And she wrote an article about refugees and women. And I have that in my papers because she said how heroic it is that these, her mother and her grandmother were able to jump ship and change their entire life. And I thought, this is a story for all of us. This is not just the Vietnamese or the Haitians as we speak. It's all of us who have to recognize that this could happen. I know the Chickasaws were very well settled in their property and their land, and they owned this. And how they were moved aside and removed was certainly not in any of their choosing. And so it's kind of humbling to think, in fact, it's important that we all imagine, what if this happened to me? And so that's really, there's a story in these paintings. They're abstracted, but they're actually, they're, um, they're tales, they're storytelling. And they're stories because Native Americans tell stories. But if you think about it, the Chinese told stories. They told legends and scroll work. And this is not exactly scroll work but it's the same kind of journeys. So these are all journey paintings. They're journeys and stories about my life. So that's it.
Is there any questions? So um, what what are the differences between (coughs) the nine paintings in the series? Are they all different parts of the story? Well, there were different series in the paintings, and some of them were liturgical. Early period was a liturgical period, and so some of the pieces like uh, uh, Chaldeans of Ur are very early of civilization and how civilizations are corrupted and fall. And then I said there were not refugees, I call them remnants, and the remnants of people. And I think that the Chickasaws were remnants. They were a bit of both. And so what we see are people that are removed or changed or, or changed by chaos. Karen actually benefited from it, from the Okinawa. See, she went to, she learned another language as a child, and she went to another high school with a lot of Okinawan children that you still know, and so. What years were you there? We were there in the 60s and the 80s. So we were there two different times. One time on Kakazu, the second time was when I was teaching for Maryland, and that's when I went off island a lot to study the history. So that was the time that I went to Yonaguni and Yishigaki and worked with the women weavers. And that's why a lot of the textile work is in here as well. So when you see like uh, the, the circles that you seem to have pretty regular in your paintings, are those the medallions that you were speaking of earlier with the Chickasaws? That you said with the with the powwow that you saw the the, the round mm-hmm. is, is that indicative of the powwow or is that both with the Chickasaw and with the Okinawan experience? That's indicative of everything I do because it's imagination. Sometimes those circles are just daydreams. Sometimes they're faces and sometimes they're conch belts, but most likely they're imagination or thoughts. Thoughts. And so there's there's in this one seven blessings. There are seven blessings in that painting because there are seven circles. So that's what that's about. So the circles mean something different with every painting. And the last one was one traveling in Honduras in the mountains. And I was daydreaming as I went through those mountains. And those circles are the daydreams that went along the path. So I have to see the painting, I guess. There's no circles in this one. This one has the swamps. Um, well, I started in uh, about 20 some years ago in Honduras, and we worked with five or six women in a shed. And the, what the purpose was, we had no idea, but as artists, uh, I wanted to give back to the community in some way that it wasn't just a pretty picture, that this had something to do with the community, it had something to do with lifestyle, it had something to do with empowerment for others. And so those women, uh, we worked with them because there's no running water, no electricity. What can you offer as an artist? So we said, well, let's try embroidery. And so we did, and the women took to it like everything because most countries, women can sew, but they don't have any idea of what to really do with it. So we taught them design, and we encouraged them to use their own culture, to record their own culture. Because a lot of times, when you're removed from your culture, your children never know your stories. They don't know where you're from or what you want to share with them. So we said, do little small squares of pictures of your stories. Tell us what your fables are. Tell us about this. And they did it, and we were stunned at how beautiful they were. The first piece we did, I drew a a four by six piece of canvas, and they hand embroidered and applique into this piece. It sold immediately, and what was fun was that we took every penny of that back to the women, and they eventually made enough to do their own daycare center. They built their daycare center so they could do this on a full-time basis. And we thought, I thought it would be one time. That's 20-some years later. 
and now we're, we were in Haiti. Right now we can't go back. We're still in Honduras, and we have been in Uganda for many years, 15 years, and we're in 14 different provinces now. We have over 900 women, I think that's the right count, now that are doing embroidery. It's all over Uganda. And uh, when the price, when it sells, that money also go, always goes back to that woman. What is, what is she doing with the money? Well, she's paying for her children to be able to go to a school. She's paying for shoes. She's paying for, of all things, seeds. So it goes back to this painting of being able to uh, do something productive with what you've done. And so the arts have become very constructive and they're very useful. This is not, again, it's something where it's part of the community and it's part of our lifestyle. It's part of living and we can't quite do without it. It's something that's universal, if that's a short answer. I'm learning, and that's the other thing about being uh, a first people. We're still learning because there's so much we don't know yet, so much wasn't written down. But uh, I do have a Dr. Caver in uh, Tupelo who sends me all these messages and sends, sends me all these pathways to understand where my grandfather was and who he was and why he was there. And I have another friend who's in Ireland now <clears throat> on a Fulbright, and she's looking at what it was like for, uh, as we get into pilgrims, let's say, uh, some of the people who came over and stayed, uh, and that's interesting too, and the five civilized tribes in Oklahoma are now celebrating what their relatives were in, the, in a mixed marriage, and a lot of those families stayed. So those people wrote things down. We know with Chickasaws in 1540, that uh, De Soto stayed with them for a winter, and uh, actually the Chickasaws didn't care much for him. And uh, he decided that he wanted to round up some Chickasaws for slavery, and they said, no, thank you, and pretty much burned the horses and him too. And he escaped with, I think, 16 soldiers, and one of the soldiers wrote the story. So that's how we know of that Chickasaw epic. But then again, like I say, some of the settlers who came and lived with the tribes wrote histories, and that's how we get a lot of our history. So. <laughs> Another question. Um, do you draw anything from the fact that I've been an Air Force wife? moving as often as you have to move, you have to pick up, decide what you have to bring with you and what you have to leave behind. Does that influence your painting as well? It influenced my children. My son, uh, in Okinawa, we had a little place up in the mountain, and the military gave us a table and chairs in the kitchen. And they were issued, military issue metal chairs. and. But my son was five and he was used to that chair that he sat in every night. And he was really emotionally upset when he found out we weren't taking that chair with us. And so, yes. And so things became very, very important to us because I realized that my children, a home was where their things were, where their possessions were. And so it was really important for me to save special things and I know they get tired of me talking about, now you know this was your grandmother so-and-so's, but the reason is that gives them a place of belonging because they didn't have a one home to go home to. So that was important. Thank you, Jim, that was a really sweet question. Thank you. And yes, we moved a lot, yeah. And so maybe that's another reason this is so important to me, is that I kind of understand, because I was in another country and I didn't speak the language, and I didn't have my home. And I went to graduate school, Japanese university, and I didn't speak the language, and I had to learn that too. And so I kind of have a heart for that. So that may be part of it. 
Good question. Yeah. Is there any smell from buffalo in your work? <laughs> My overcoat. <laughs> Thank you. No, snow. Snow? Oh, I thought you said. Uh, yes. Yes, Jim. I did a series of uh, Native Americans dancing in different seasons, and there is one snow season. Yeah, actually, yes. But I didn't name it Buffalo. Yeah, we spent a year in Buffalo. A very deep year. <laughs> a very deep year in Buffalo. Yes, we did. <laughs> so, Brenda, you've been working on some of the, the, these themes of chaos yes. and removal have been weaving themselves throughout your work across many, many years. Um, has the story changed for you, or become more clear in your mind, or do you have new insights onto it, or do you feel like you're getting closer to an answer? Um. It's messages. It keeps coming through as messages. And uh, at first I didn't know where, where these were taking us. As I said earlier, like a scroll. It's, these are scrolls or messages telling me uh, over and again these, these thoughts. And they're very important. And somehow, as I was telling you on the phone, I said, I, I need to say this because this involves so many people who have to come through this, and maybe with this, with these words, there's more understanding. Maybe people will listen and hear how difficult it is to to come through all of these changes. You may not have to move from everything that you own or know. It may be an illness. It could be a lot of different ways that chaos affects us. But I think it, it's so important that we're able to listen to each other and have some compassion for, for that. And the other message was that the arts are so incredibly invaluable in this message. They are so important because they have a different way of telling you the stories. It's a gentle persuasion, and that part is, is important too. Yeah, that's true. The arts do contain, each art form contains important information and knowledge mm -hmm. in weavings and pottery and painting. Mm -hmm. So when you think about a culture that's lost or is losing those traditions, it's mm -hmm. all the knowledge with it that go, gets lost. One thing the Okinawans did that I respect is they kept their culture. They kept the exact glazes, the exact clay body that they had from the beginning. And so their traditions, their pots are 600-year-old traditions, their cans are all um, wood fire. And so what happened out of that in history is uh, Bernard Leach and the English potter and some of the, the most Hamada all came to Okinawa and sat with these old potters and talked to them and said, oh, and how do you put, how much wood do you put and how much do you build? And, and I was down there listening and I was just an Air Force wife sitting there and I had no idea who Bernard Leach was, and of course I got home to art history and was humbled. But I realized that if we're working together, artists love to work together and hear how they're doing things. And I really loved Cahoon for this. Thank you so much. Just last night I talked to Potters and said, well, how did you do that? I can't do that. And it was really fun to communicate with other artists. So, so that's history too. Well, because there's light. When, it, when the seeds are below, there's always light that are giving them life. And that always is true. That's always true. We're not always in, in if we focus on the chaos, <laughs> we have to have the light. We have to be, if we're remnants or things are happening, there's always an upside to it, too. There's always that, too. And if you, if you think that way, all of these, these have a beauty to them, 
too, because none of us escape that, but it's how we deal with it. It's, it's what we do with it. So I think that's it. So Your positivity is just remarkable. <laughs> you know, the hope. Thank you. Well, it's whatever it is that they have in there, I mean, it does. Well, the most come through, especially the most with you. Well, the, the most incredible art is the one who's been through some, some times. You, you, don't, you have to earn your dues. You pay your dues. And I think you learn in all that. That's part of it. I, I think a weaver is amazing. I, I think, how can they possibly measure and think and do all the things they do? They have to pay their dues and learn how to do that. They have to work through the process. And I think we have to work through this process, and when we do, we keep evolving, we keep progressing. So that's the hope in that. That was that painting back there, I don't know how many years ago. It was the same thing, it's about hope, really. You're it's the light. But you're amazing. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I have a comment for the question. Um, so, wandering around. That may be first people thinking. Mm -hmm. That's what that is, naturally. I mean, it just comes natural, I think. And I think it's because um, one time David Brooks said that, uh, he said something in one of his talks about dance, and I was stunned by that, because that's what I think too. It's about the dance, if you want to call it life or whatever you call it. But it is about the dance, and then all of these have a dance element, they have a movement. And they have a, with, it's a dance within the system. It's not a dance performance. It's a dance within life. That's what it is. So, yeah, you had a good observation. And what I said earlier about uh, the Chinese, all of their paintings, mankind is the, the least significant part of the painting. And. Uh, I think there's something to the humbleness of that that's kind of beautiful. Man in nature, but he's just a part of it. He's not in command of it. And I think we've lost that. So that may be part of the refugee story that I'm trying to say, is we've lost our focus and sometimes, maybe. Thank you. Too, Brenda, when you talk about Tupelo and her reaction to the land, having not been born there, mm -hmm. lived there, that there's some part of that land still connected to you on some deep level. Well, it connected all of us, all of us that went there and stood on those mounds. And uh, one of my uh, Muskokian Creek girlfriend was standing there and she started singing. And uh, it was so beautiful. And uh, we were all, I don't know what you'd call it, we were smack dabbed. We really were amazed by, by it. And so when we got home, we were calling each other, we were saying, we've got to do something about this. And so we are doing something. We don't have, we, the venue isn't all there. We do have a curator, we do have some, a Native American curator, the, the one that just started FAM in Oklahoma City. And so she's interested in curating this, uh, but we're putting together another show or another exhibit or another, but it will be more than that because it's going to be about the, it's going to be about the emotional part of the experience that we had standing on those mounds. You can't stand on a burial mound, by the way. That's not, not appropriate, but you can on the, the treasure mounds. So we're learning out of that. There's a lot of books on mounds, Cahokia, and you can read all those histories, but to have a physical reaction to standing on the mound, all of us, was quite wonderful. Uh, do you, 
Linda, do you ever feel, um, when you're painting, do you ever feel connected to your ancestors? I mean, it's hard to say where inspiration comes from, but do you ever dream or feel um, any kind of messages coming through to help that way? Yes. Um, I have a trunk that's a uh, hide skin trunk, and when my Chickasaw grandmother passed, I got this trunk. And uh, one of the books I gave you, grandmother, I'll wake up in the middle of the night and go in the library, and, there, and I'll pick up a book, and in it will be her writing. She uh, was a house mother at Bacon Indian College. And uh, she took creative writing when she was 62. And the point of it is, she was messaging in these stories that she wrote. And then I was picking up these books and finding things. Well, I opened the trunk, and in the side slip behind is a letter. And I'm finding this letter from my grandmother to my, sis my half-sister, who's gone, uh, passed. But it, she was telling her about this trunk that was something that my great-great-great-grandfather used in his negotiations for treaties back in the 1700s. And so, yes. So I feel like she was giving me messages. And so that trunk is now going back to the nation, of course. But I would never have known it. And my sister used it, used it for tack, for her horse stuff. And so I'm so grateful that I found that message. You ask a good question. <laughs> yes. I think that's it. Yeah, just so appreciative to have your work here. Yeah. And like you're saying, this positive message and a message of hope. Because even if we're not refugees ourselves, um, we can have empathy for people in Mm -hmm. different situations and maybe our parents or grandparents were. I know Michael's from Ireland and um, I'm sure moving to Cape Cod, I mean even in, in smaller ways it's a, you know it's a new culture and things are different. So I think your stories are very relatable on a, on a global and human level. Mm -hmm. So I think um, they definitely resonate with people. I'm excited to share them with the community here let you know how, how people respond to them. Well, the Wampanoas can tell you the same story. Yes. They'll be, they'll be telling you this story, too. Yes. How much Actually, fun. Yeah, we, had a, we had a wonderful virtual program recently about um, the Cape Cod ecology project. Mm -hmm. And we had a Mona Pia Peterson from the Cape Cod Tribe and um, she did a she was kind of editing herself a little bit for the audience, but she said that when she sees a bulldozer, she feels it viscerally, mm -hmm. and that, and I had not thought about that before, the movement of earth, mm -hmm. and if you're still connected to the earth, and people are moving it, what does that do to you? So there's, even though they're here on their land, you know, they, things are still happening to their land. And In Tupelo, we went on one tour of a place that had been a burial site that was now a suburbia, a lot of houses. And it's, it was pitiful. We all parked our cars and walked across a driveway and a, and a block and a, a yard. And we stood there at a little, just a little street and thought this was, this was a very serious sight at one time. And cars were honking and stopping at the lights and no one knew that they were over something that was very spiritual for someone else. So I think what you said is very poignant. Yeah. We don't know all the time how important it is. So. And even the, um, the names of the natural things around us, we have in our ponds and our areas have different names, but they had other names before too. Yes. Sometimes I wish I could get that history, mm -hmm. know the full story, but I think sometimes if you spend enough time outside, sometimes the, the nature will speak to you directly, too. It does. Yeah. Thank you for having me at Cahoon, by the oh, way. Oh, it's, 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 it's been my pleasure. It's an absolute pleasure. We're so uh, appreciative to share your work um, for 
we get a lot of regional visitors too on Cape Cod. Cape Cod is a special place. Yes, it is. Uh, who knows who might come through, who sees your work and is inspired. Hopefully so. Yeah. Hopefully so. Thank you. Wonderful show. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. This is preaching to the choir. Yeah. <laughs> it was perfect. <laughs>